You're listening to Grow Radio, episode 43. Welcome back to the show, everyone. I was just sitting here reflecting on how we're actually almost at the end of season two of this show. We're almost 50 episodes in, and thousands and thousands of downloads later, here we are. You know, I was thinking back to this time last year when I had just purchased a podcast mic, and I was so nervous, and I knew that I had this desire to create this free platform, but I was so scared to actually actually do the thing that I held it off until about April of last year. And all I can say is it's been a year, nearly 50 episodes, all of these downloads later, we've spoken to thought leaders from all over the world in the areas of functional medicine, holistic health, uh, you know, business, uh, entrepreneurship, all of this. And all I can say, looking back and reflecting on where we've come since this, this podcast began just in April, trust me, friends, if you have a desire in your heart, whether it's to start a podcast, launch that crazy, crazy business idea you've been thinking about, whatever it is, life is too short to wait, to ponder, or to hold out for the perfect circumstance. It is time for you to go and do the thing. So with all of that being said, I just want to take a moment and extend so much gratitude to you for being here, for listening to this show, for every review that you leave, every like, every share, every time you post, you know, this is absolutely everything. You know, you're the fuel that is keeping this free platform going. And I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for being part of this experience. And today... I certainly have an experience for you. I've got Evan Brand on the show. Evan is a podcast host, certified functional medicine practitioner, and nutritional therapist. He's passionate about healing the chronic fatigue, obesity, and depression epidemics after solving his own IBS and depression issues. He uses at-home lab testing and customized supplement programs to find and fix the root cause of a wide range of health symptoms. His Evan Brand podcast has over seven million downloads and counting. He's the author of Stress Solutions, REM Rehab, and the Everything Guide to Nootropics. He offers free 15-minute functional medicine phone consultations to discuss your health symptoms and goals at his site, evanbrand.com. And I'll be honest, I was really excited to have Evan on the show because I've heard him speak in a number of summits, I've been following his work for a number of years, and I just genuinely appreciate his approach to health and the body. And, you know, we're speaking about something that really touches home for both of us, which is the connection between mold exposure and Lyme disease. This is an episode that has so many great nuggets of wisdom from Evan. I encourage you, give it a listen, share it with someone who can use this information, someone that's going to be served by this information. So without further ado, guys, let's dive into this. I'm so excited to introduce you to Evan Brand. I'm Michelle Bro, and this is Grow Radio. I'm a holistic nutritionist and wellness business coach whose mission is to help you live a life on fire. I believe that in order to achieve our highest aspirations, we must lead. In this podcast, I'm connecting you with some of today's brightest thought leaders who are sharing their biggest nuggets of wisdom on all things health, relationships, and business. So, are you ready to dive in? Then grab your favorite hot drink and let's get into today's episode. All right, everyone. I am so, so excited to introduce you to Evan Brand. Evan, welcome to the show. Hey, Michelle. Thanks for having me. So pumped to have you here today. I would love to start out by just getting a little intro from you. Tell us who you are, what you do, how you got into the work you're doing today in the wellness space. Uh, I'm a wounded warrior, like (laughs) most people in the health space. I uh, had a lot of health issues myself that conventional doctors just had no answers to, or if they did have answers, it was pharmaceutical drugs, like acid blocking medications for my gut issues or mood stabilizing drugs when I was having depression and anxiety problems. And so I denied all the prescriptions and just had to figure this stuff out myself. And so, uh, which it sounds really cool, but it's not that cool because it's, you know, 10 years of suffering and strategic tweaking of protocols and random supplements and diets and all that. So when people say, Oh, I fixed myself, it's like, Ooh, that's a hard journey. And so uh, it really took diet changes, lifestyle, uh, herbs, moving, 
cross country several times. You know, if you're homesick, you can't heal your body. If you're like I was, I was living in Texas, but my family was in Kentucky and I was homesick. So homesickness kept me ill. So it didn't matter, you know, how much work I did with supplements to calm anxiety. I was anxious because I missed my family and I didn't have that social support. And so a lot of times with these health problems, people are looking at the biochemical, you know, biochemistry, the physical structural stuff, if you're a chiropractor and, and you're missing the boat, you're missing the emotional piece. Like if you've, if you're homesick, you know, that's just a key example of me. So, uh, so I run a functional medicine clinic now, which is just strictly online doing consults with people around the world. And uh, I've helped over a thousand people. Most people have been to five, 10, 20 practitioners before they get to me, which is not to toot my horn. That's just the reality. And I end up uncovering things that other people did not uncover, or I just have a different approach than some other people. So if you think it's just candida and you go and treat somebody for candida, but you forgot that they also had parasites and bacterial overgrowth problems and adrenal issues and liver problems and lymphatic issues and Lyme disease and mold toxin, then treating the candida doesn't get someone better. So I'm kind of the, the last hope, the last ditch effort for most people, which is an interesting place to operate from. And, and then I run a podcast, which is how most people find me and uh, just talk about the stuff we're talking about today all the time. That's amazing. And, you know, I was really happy to have you on the show because our mm-hmm. stories are very similar. I had, um, just to give you a bit of background on myself, back in 2017, I had been severely, severely sick for a couple of years. Same kind of story. You know, I was going to specialists. I lost an immense amount of weight. My platelets were so low that I would like nurse my son and then I would have blood in my knuckles. Um, I, I had debilitating fatigue, horrible sleep, anxiety, digestive issues. I mean, I was so sick by the time I found functional medicine um, and someone who really understood how to help me that I was showing signs my body was starting to go septic. And I was misdiagnosed with kidney disease and leukemia. And I honestly wonder if I would be sitting in a hospital right now receiving dialysis, assuming that my condition was due to kidney disease, if I didn't question the diagnosis of my medical doctor. And So someone, you know, someone diagnosed you with leukemia? My doctor said, I believe it's leukemia. We're going to send you to a, we're going to send you to a hematologist. And then I went, I got the, you know, they send you the requisition and they give you, they send you to another doctor. That's how they do it here in Canada anyway. So then I drove a few hours to see a hematologist and the hematologist was testing me for leukemia and lymphoma and all these different things. And um, that came back negative. And then she said, well, I just don't know what's wrong with you. I just know that your platelets are extremely low and this is happening. But what happened was I had absolutely, this is the, the true diagnosis that I've discovered and how it kind of like folds into your story of, you know, having more than one thing going on. Um, but I had learned that I had absolutely no stomach acid, which <laughs> resulted in having entamoeba histolytica, which is a type of parasite that is nasty. Um, I was exposed to mold. Um, specifically okra toxin A and two others in a massive amount. My kidneys, which were showing signs that they were starting to go septic, of course, okra toxin A is a nephrotoxin and an immunotoxin and it causes cancer and all these different things. I had chronic reactivated Epstein-Barr, which was causing my platelets to drop. And I also had two co-infections of Lyme. I had Babesia and Rickettsia. And I know you have um, both sort of a personal and a professional sort of experience with these things through your practice. And, you know, when I threw a few ideas on what to, on what to talk about today, I was really excited that you were on the same page with me as speaking on mold and Lyme in particular. So can you tell us a little bit more about your experience with bees in particular and why these topics really hit home for you as well? Yeah, well, sorry you had to go through all that, and hopefully you're still on the up and up on the mend. You know, we try to get back to a (laughs) good, good. We try to get back to 100%. You may say you did. Uh, I'm not back to 100%. I don't think most people ever do get back to 100%. I think once the switch is triggered, there's always a possibility for you to go backwards when new things pop up. So stressors, travel, relationship stress, drama, whatever. You know that you become a little more. I use the analogy of a tightrope. Meaning if you do nothing to treat yourself, you fall off the tightrope on one side. If you do too much treatment and you're overdoing it, you're trying to fix everything with, that's wrong with you at the same time, then you go fall off the other side of the tightrope. So, so kind of walking 
people back to health is trying to figure out exactly where that tightrope is. And the interesting thing is, is the goalpost moves all the time. So if you're sleeping better, you may be able to handle more detoxification. If your sleep is not as good, then you may have to go more gentle. So that's the tricky part about why most people need to be working with a clinician if they're listening to this and they're interested or they're affected by these issues because it's tricky. You know, and, I, and I'm somebody, somebody who I feel very confident with what I do, but even working on myself is extremely, extremely difficult. So you often need a, a third set of eyes to see stuff that you haven't seen. Like possibly you have to go low histamine with your diet and that's a tweak you need to make to help lower inflammation for a while and lower reactivity for a while. But, uh, you know, I grew up in the woods and loved the woods and still love the woods. I went hiking yesterday with my father-in-law. We had a blast and luckily it's cold enough to where there's no ticks active right now. But, you know, I've had countless tick bites throughout my life. And my friend Scott, he suggests that once I got exposed to mold, that that really activated the tick-borne issue. So I tested indeterminate for Lyme, which it's not negative, not positive. And then I showed up with Babesia and Bartonella, which are both a beast to deal with and could be really, really tough. Uh, you know, Babesia is kind of related to malaria and the fact that it can infect your red blood cells and it causes just exhaustion. I mean, you're just tired. It, it's not, not fun to have, but, you know, dealing with that personally made me more empathetic because you see a lot of these things on test results and, you know, you'll try to come in with some herbs to make a protocol. But once you've been through it, you see it and you know, somebody's top complaint is fatigue. And then you see they have Babesia. It's like, Oh, or you see they have mold toxins. It's like, Oh my God, I totally understand your fatigue. Uh, you're not crazy at all. And some people, you know, with these issues, especially in combination, like we're talking about, you know, these people could be bedridden. And I used to, I would, you know, people would kind of say that to me. They'd say, you know, I've been in bed for, for six weeks and I would have to probe them. Like, what do you mean you've been in bed for six weeks? Are you saying you literally are in bed for six weeks or like you're, you're getting up to eat and then you're running back to bed? Like, what's the logistics here? And of course the answers vary, but yeah, I mean, there's some people that are so exhausted just getting through a day is, is tough. And there was a study that a guy named Dr. Potter did and he found in uh, chronic fatigue patients, he had maybe, I always forget the number, but it was a lot. It was like a hundred or a couple hundred or several hundred patients that he had in his clinic that were diagnosed with chronic fatigue, chronic fatigue syndrome, CFS, whatever you want to call it. And 93, 95% of those patients had mold toxin and most of them have multiple mold toxin. So when we look at these weird diagnoses that people get, you know, we're talking Lyme and mold, but your average person doesn't go, I think I have mold or Lyme. Your average person goes, I have chronic fatigue. I have depression. I have anxiety. I have fibromyalgia, right? So they come in with the conventional term, conventional terminology. Okay. You've got chronic fatigue or you've got fibromyalgia. And then that is where it ends. That's where people get on some type of drug, but there's no question of, well, why? Why do you have chronic fatigue? Why do you have fibromyalgia? And in my experience, and based on a lot of the things I'm seeing clinically, the answer to that question is most of the time Lyme, co-infections, and or mold. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, for me, like one of the big shockers was, and it's like, I knew this, but I didn't. So, you know, like you're aware of it, but you don't put the pieces together until after it happens. But for myself, I was in a house, my husband and I had purchased a house and the people who owned it prior to us actually painted over mold in the bathroom. So it wasn't visible, um, but I was breathing it in and it was spreading. And when we saw this ochre toxin A and two other uh, sources of mold in, on a mycotox panel, um, it was so shocking. And we were like, okay, it's probably in the basement. It's got to be, you know, you think, okay, where could moisture be? Probably in the basement. And as soon as an inspector walked in, he knew exactly where it was. But the thing that blew me away was these are from the penicillin family. And I, when I was a little girl, I had, um, I had to take penicillin for something and I had a horrible reaction and I was allergic. I, I've always known as a kid growing up that I was allergic to penicillin. So here I am in a moldy house. I'm breathing this in all the time. That shuts off the old stomach acid production, I'm sure. And I'm allergic to it. So it's hitting me like crazy. And 
my husband and you know my the rest of my family feels absolutely nothing but i'm just like what is happening to me and all these things are just compiling but you know i didn't put the pieces together until after that oh i'm allergic to penicillin so that was absolutely a huge trigger but you know from from your perspective like we talked about the fatigue we talked about the pain like the fibromyalgia kind of symptoms what other sort of common symptoms are you seeing in people that are exposed to mold? Sure, yeah, and I'll just comment on what you said real quick and then I'll answer that, which is even if you weren't allergic, it wouldn't matter. Uh, if you are breathing in mycotoxins and genetically you just don't make any sort of detox process, you know, that's what happens to us canaries in the coal mine is our bodies just don't recognize the mold toxins. So even if someone says, oh, I'm not allergic, it doesn't matter, you could still, you could still get sick from it. And you know, you're breathing this in, as you mentioned, primarily through through water damaged buildings, but also it doesn't have to be just a water damaged building, right? You don't have to have a flood necessarily to have this issue. You could just have high humidity. So if you live anywhere where there's high humidity, which is pretty much everywhere in Canada and the US, except for maybe New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, you've got some drier climates there, but pretty much everywhere else, you've got high moisture. And so we have whole house dehumidifiers that run in our house to help keep things at 40% max. You know, if you're at 50, 55% humidity in your house, even if you had no water leak, you can have mold. And so uh, regarding symptoms, Dr. Richie Shoemaker's done a great job of putting together a bunch of symptoms. So it could be anything. Like I don't want to bore people. I would just say, look at his whole list. There's like a million different things that could manifest as weird symptoms that are actually mold. But some of the key ones are, we mentioned the fatigue, the joint pain, uh, diarrhea is common, probably because the body's trying to flush the toxin out is my guess of why you have diarrhea, uh, possibly loose stool that alternates with constipation. Uh, stomach pain is a big one. Uh, this, this is for mold. And then we can talk co-infections, which could be a whole nother hour by itself. Uh, <laughs> yes. You've got what else do you have? Uh, the joint pain, I think, is a big one that a lot of people don't associate with mold, but it can be. Sinus issues, although I've had no sinus issues at all and I had tons of mold. Um, headaches are big. Uh, dizziness, vertigo, those were absolutely huge for me. I'm still recovering from some of the dizziness issues. Um, your eyes can have some issues as well, like your vision can change. And so there's a test that people can do called a VCS, as in Victor Charlie Sam VCS test. And that's something you could do online. And most people that have biotoxin illness, meaning Lyme or co-infection or mold, they'll fail that test. And if you fail that test, that just means that you've got an issue and you got to figure out what the heck it is. And so as you get better, hopefully your vision test scores will improve. But basically you look at these little circles and you try to identify which way are they pointing. And when you have these toxic exposures, I think the mechanism is you have reduced blood flow just overall, you know, cold hands, cold feet can happen, but you also have reduced blood flow or nerve signaling to the eyes. And so you literally are unable to take in as much information into the eyes as you're supposed to. And as it gets, as you get less toxic, that improves. So I think those are, those are some of the, the big ones. Uh, skin issues would be something else. You know, a lot of people, the, people forget the skin is a detox organ. So your liver and kidneys are damaged due to mold toxin like yours were. And you, your skin is trying to pinch hit for some of the toxicity that can happen. Luckily for me, I didn't have any skin issues at all. Uh, heart palpitations, that's something I dealt with. Uh, blood pressure issues were big. You know, these, all of these mold, Lyme, Bartonella, Babesia, all of these things, they all trigger or they can trigger, I guess, they can trigger mast cell activation. Mast cells are part of your immune system. They're a specialized white blood cell that, think of it like the, uh, it's a special forces. It's the special, like the bomb squad, you know, the bomb squad doesn't get called too often, hopefully, but after you get exposed to these type of toxins, now the mast cells become hyperreactive. I think of it like a balloon that's filled with histamine and trip days and other mediators and that balloon now has a bunch of holes in it and so all of a sudden you've got histamine leaking out for no reason you've got all these reactions for no reason that's just like the bomb squad being called all the time when they're not necessary right it's like you're involving someone who should be a rare situation like a mast cell reaction should be rare meaning if you get stung by a bee you know that flood of histamine that's totally normal and totally in response to what's going on but you know, I suffered quite a bit with this mast cell issue and I'm still likely calming down uh, mast cell activation that I've dealt with. And 
what will happen is, you know, there was a point where, you know, I was having blood pressure issues just based on smelling a fragrance. So if I would have, a, I had contractors in my house doing some work and, you know, they would have laundry or cologne or, or other smells on and those smells would literally drive up my blood pressure. And the average person listening to that would say, are you crazy? That's absolutely insane. What do you mean smells or chemicals make your blood pressure go up? And that's what mast cell activation is. It's these un, it's these, uh, irrational responses to things that normal people wouldn't react to. And that's where it gets really scary. And that's where if you're at that point of reactions, you really, really, really have to have a practitioner because it can get into uh, some pretty dangerous territory. You know, when your blood, your blood sugar is affected, your blood pressure is affected, all body systems are going haywire. You can't just go to whole foods and buy activated charcoal and take it and expect to get better. It gets a lot more tricky than that. Yeah, there's, there's so many things that have to come into play. I feel like with, if you look at a thousand people, there's a thousand different ways to approach it. And I know for myself, like I was bitten, I was bitten by a tick when I was like seven or eight years old. And of course, back then, you know, they just, my parents took me to the hospital and they pulled it out of my armpit with a pair of tweezers. And <laughs> like, I look at the way things have changed. And I look at also the, just the assumption of you know, my practitioners right now, they are like, well, this was probably dormant in your body for decades. And it wasn't until I was in a moldy environment that it was able to sort of come up for me. So I feel like there are a lot of misconceptions about, you know, like how these things can, like we assume, you know, if you're bitten by a tick, you, you get a big rash and then all of a sudden you're, you have to go in and get antibiotics right away or else. And if you don't get a rash, you're fine. And I feel like there's so many, number one, misconceptions around that. But also, like, do you hear a lot of stories from your clients about these things possibly having been in a dormant state for a long period of time? Like, is this something that you see quite a bit? Oh, definitely. Yeah. So let's go back to the Babesia Bartonella stuff real quick, just to give just a few, like, maybe key symptoms that would kind of distinguish those from mold. So this is tricky because yes. we're trying to combine, like, three hours worth of podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> so I just need to call that out now yes, because uh, these are all extremely complicated and have, and have extremely separate clinical outcomes and protocols. But since we, since we opened the can of worms, let's go down the rabbit hole a little bit. So Babesia, uh, something that kind of clued me into the Babesia for me was the air hunger. People call it air hunger. It's basically, you feel like you just can't get a full breath. So, you know, I would go down and you know, I've got, a pretty large property and I would go down to the bottom of the hill where the creek is and you know I go down the hill and back up the hill and I was out of breath and I was like okay either I'm really out of shape which I didn't feel like I was or something is not right I just could not catch a breath and so that's what kind of clued me in I'm like oh, this just doesn't make sense and you know that's there's probably multiple mechanisms I probably don't understand all the mechanisms something to do with your oxygen transport, nitric oxide and blood flow restriction and inflammation. I mean, it's all connected, but that was one thing that clued me into Babesia. And often you can have a, a lot of emotional changes too. So there's actually several medical doctors that are doing really good work. If you just type in like Lyme or Babesia or Bartonella and mental illness, you know, there's huge, huge studies that have been done on looking at homicide and suicide and schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and major depressive disorder and uh, anxiety disorders and OCD and all these issues related to Lyme and co-infection. So if someone has a mental illness, they, they absolutely must be investigated for mold and Lyme or co-infections because the data is there and it is probably due to the brain inflammation that all these bugs create. But for me too, the Babesia can cause a lot of uh, this feeling that you're disconnected from reality. It's sort of like you're dreaming. You feel like you're not really present in your body. That's, that's Babesia. Other, other bugs can do that too, but Babesia is common. And then Bartonella is anxiety for no reason. Uh, panic attacks could be out of the blue. You could have major depression, like that you would call more despair or hopelessness than depression. So depression is kind of like, uh, life sucks. Hopelessness is like, it's over. Life is over. You know, it's, it's 
a much, much deeper state, which is not a good place to be. And then, of course, the mood stuff for Bartonella can be the same. So kind of that disconnected from reality, potentially headaches, dizziness, vertigo, weird tingling, uh, numbness. So like your face could go numb, your feet could go numb, your hands could go numb. That's a lot more common with Lyme, but co-infections can happen as well. Uh, I think that's enough. I think it's enough to to kind of clue people in. Okay. So before we go back to the topic of the dormancy, I do want to, I do want to ask something about that, about Bell's palsy. You were talking about like the numbness in your face. So I, I believe it was Dr. Klinghart who said that all cases of Bell, Bell's palsy are related to Lyme. Have you heard wow. this? I'm just curious because I know, like I know people who have had Bell's palsy who have no other health issues. And I'm always like, Hmm. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. I mean, Klinghart's a good dude. Uh, a lot of the stuff he says is really smart. I don't know if I would say all cases. I mean, mm. maybe he's right. I mean, I have no idea. I don't have enough, I don't have enough data or clients with Bell palsy to confirm, Hey, uh, mm. Lyme, but I have had people that have had like drooping eyelids and one side of their face is droopy and they did test positive for Lyme. So I think it's totally plausible. I think if you had Bell's palsy, because he said it, you should probably test it and potentially try to treat you know, Lyme and see mm. if you get better. But to say it's 100%, I don't know. Yeah, you know, and it's no wonder that so many people, right, you know, so many people are dealing with like mystery illnesses where they have all these symptoms, they're going to so many doctors, like you said, you know, they're, they're spending 10 years before they even find you just trying to figure this out on their own. And like, you know, it's, it's because there's more than one thing at play and it's because these things can manifest differently for every single person. And until you have, like from my own perspective, functional medicine was amazing for this because they look at the body as a whole. Um, but yeah, anyhow, I, I personally really like the same kind of thing you said about Babesia. Like for me, it was a feeling of the only way I could have explained it was that my life was not my own. It was like I was in my body, but I was like living someone else's life. It was just this strange feeling that I could not, I couldn't explain it to anyone other than to say that like my life is not my own. And, um, you know, the big thing I would love to add to that is that there's, you know, there's another side to it. It's, it's sort of giving people hope that there's a way to figure these things out and move through them. Um, and, and just, I think just being aware that that was a common symptom of it was like, oh, it's like so relieving, you know, so healing even just to, to make that connection. Yeah, you think you're going crazy. I mean, it can be super isolating too, because you don't know exactly what's wrong with you. So a lot of people, you know, you'll, you'll kind of socially isolate yourself because you're not sure exactly what's affecting you. You're, you don't know. It's like, okay, is it this building? Is it, is it these people? Like, what is it my job? What is it? So <laughs> It can be very confusing and, and things change too, which is the hard part. So this month it may be that symptom and then the next month it may be that symptom. That's a confusing part too. It's like you try to pursue this one symptom or this one issue, but then the game plan changes on you. Then it's like, oh, wait a second. What was working before is not working. Now what do we do? So there's a lot of, uh, it's like chess. I mean, you kind of move this piece forward and then, uh-oh, you got to move that piece backward. And then now you're going to get the this piece over here and then the queen gets involved and then the king, I mean, it gets, so yeah, it's, it's tough is all I could say, but I do know that eventually you can pull apart these layers. It's just tough to tease it apart. And for example, you know, there's some months where I'm taking more herbs specifically for Babesia and other months I'm taking more stuff for Bartonella. So that's the hard part is what do you do and when do you do it? And the answer is it depends and it changes all the time. Like I said, it's a moving goalpost. Totally. Yeah. Um, but I never got to your question. What was the question that we kind of forgot to answer? The question was, do have you seen like from your own practice and stuff, a lot of people who have had this experience where Lyme or co-infections have been in a dormant state for long periods of time. And then all of a sudden, you know, they're in a moldy house and then boom, they're like, oh, well, where did this Lyme come from? You know, it's like trying to make that connection because it has happened so long ago. You know, for myself, I was like six or seven, maybe, or eight when I was bitten. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's a hard question to answer, right? Because we don't have we, we may not have that lab data before on somebody. So like if we're looking at antibodies or something, we may not see, we may not see what we're looking for. Meaning they may show positive now, but does that mean they had 
Bartonella for 20 years and all of a sudden it just got activated. I, I have no clue. So I think it depends on, on the case, but in general, many people who've even had cat scratches, for example. So like there's some crazy number, like 80% of cats have Bartonella Hensleyae, which is a super common infection. And so if you ever roughhouse with your cat and your cat scratches you, you could get Bartonella that way. You could also get Bartonella from mosquitoes and everybody's had mosquito bites and, and biting flies even could transmit Bartonella. So a lot of times it's trying to do a history, but even then the history gets muddy because okay, yeah, you haven't had a, hic- a tick bite for 20 years, but what about mosquito? Oh yeah, you got 20 bites of mosquitoes last year. So I think ultimately you could drive yourself crazy trying to figure out exactly when did you get exposed to these things and did this reactivate or is this new? A- at a certain point, it doesn't matter. You just have to focus on what are you up against now? And then you try to have, you just have to try to prioritize what do you go after, which is, which is challenging too because the interesting thing which people may or may not have caught up on already is is there's quite a bit of overlap with these symptoms so if you remember in school doing those venn diagrams where you've got a one circle over here with a bunch of symptoms you've got another circle over here and then in between the middle you've got those two circles that intertwine with each other and in between you've got symptoms of both right so that's the hard part if you've got lime on one venn diagram you've got mold on the other those things intersect, meaning you could have dizziness from mold and Lyme. You could have joint pain from mold and Lyme. You could have diarrhea from both. You could have headaches from both. So that's where the art comes in. People (laughs) think of, you know, and and when I used to hear that, you know, maybe five years ago, I would say, oh, come on in art. Like how is, how is medicine an art, right? Isn't it? You do the labs and then here's the protocol and then you do it and you get better. No, it's really not black or white at all. Like I, I kind of wish it was, it would make our job a lot easier if it were black and white, but, but no, that is where the arc comes in. Meaning you may have to try to pursue mold detox and then you do that for three to six months and then you hit a stone wall and then you go, okay, so what do we do now? Because we're stuck at 30% symptom improvement. How do we get to that next layer of improvement, right? What, what comes next? How are we going to go from on a scale of one to 10? I started out feeling at a two. I'm trying to get to a 10. Now I'm stuck at a five. What do I do to get from five to seven? Well, it may be this, you get 10% here. You may be parasites, you get 10% there. So this is where you have to, you got to be motivated. And from a clinician perspective, it's tough because you've got to give people enough progress so that they stay motivated for the long haul. Meaning it may take one to three years to really detox your body of mold completely, at least based on some of my personal labs and some of my clients, you know, I'd say a year minimum to really do some good, good work. How do you keep that client motivated for a year to get to that one to three year mark? And people may hear that and go, Oh my God, one to three years. It's like, look, if you're 50 and I'm telling you, we're, we're going to reverse a lifetime of accumulated mycotoxins in a year. That is extremely fast. Are you crazy? So you just have to kind of, give people realistic expectations and and make sure you're framing it in a positive way rather than, Oh, it's going to take a year. I hope you can make it. No, it's like a year is fast. You better make it. That's no, no time to reverse this. So this is where the art comes in. It's managing expectations. It's setting timelines. It's knowing when to change gears. It's what are you prioritizing this month? What can you do to improve symptoms now to keep that person feeling good enough to get to the deep work they need to do. Right. So there's a lot of, a lot of levers that we're tweaking in those cases. Totally. I mean, that's so funny. I remember, I remember after like month one of like, once I figured out what was going on, I was at the 30 day mark and I'm like, why am I not better yet? You know, of course now looking back, I laugh, but I was pissed at month one. I was like, come on. And now it's just like, you know, healing is just a daily practice. It's like, you know, it's just like having breakfast. It's just a part of my whole lifestyle and my experience of the world around me. But I totally agree with you. You know, I always say the body is a symphony and, you know, everything's kind of connected and works together, but healing is like a cha-cha. We take a few steps forward and then we kind of adjust and we take a step back and then we move forward a little bit. And so I love that. I love that you said um, that you kind of called it an art there, but yeah, you know, I, I wish, I wish it were not a cha-cha, you know, I wish it were linear yeah. <laughs> and you could go point A to point B you start at the first step, you end on the 10th step. I wish it worked that way. I really do. It would make things a lot more simple, but 
yeah, it is. A cha-cha is a good way to put it. Yeah, there'd be a lot less people confused and, and suffering with these things if it was that easy, but yeah. <laughs> fortunately it's not. And there's so many other things I feel that come into play, especially with mold and um, like the connection with um, EMF and how that can sort of cause mold and mycotoxins to reproduce. And that can be a whole other thing where you're doing all the things right, but you're streaming movies on your laptop on your belly all night, every night. And like, you know, there's, there's just so many different parts of this, but um, you know, I feel like just in talking about how everything works together in the body this is really where um, I think conventional medicine falls short. And, you know, I, I don't want to be the person who bashes it because I feel that, you know, if I fall down and break my leg, thank goodness I can go to my, you know, my hospital um, for any sort of like acute issue. But when it comes to something chronic, like in my own case, my, I was going to a hematologist because I had low platelets in my blood. So they're assuming, okay, there's an issue in the blood. We need a blood doctor you know, or if there's digestive issues, okay, we need a gastroenterologist, but they're not taking a step back and understanding that, okay, there's an immune system, there's a gut, there's a liver gallbladder, there's skin, like that, all these pieces are so, so connected. So yeah, yeah, you make a great point too, which is the over specialization of medicine. It's a huge problem because how many gastro docs are going to bring up mold toxin as a potential cause of your diarrhea? I yes. would estimate zero. <laughs> and if, if there's one out there, please email my staff and let's do a podcast together. And I'd love to have you because thank God you're getting it. But that's the problem is, you know, in your example, like the blood doctor, maybe a blood doctor out there would think, okay, there could be an issue like Lyme disease or co-infections. You know, one interesting thing that really surprised me and it really kind of helped, I don't want to say put me in the right direction because I was already headed in the right direction, but it was just a good b a bump of confidence was when I started having vision problems and I went to an eye doctor and I was like, I just can't, I can't explain to you what's going on. My vision is just kind of fuzzy. I was like, it's like, I can see clearly, but at the same time, I can't see clearly. I don't know how to describe it to you. So they put me through all their different eye exam. Right. And I was thinking, okay, it's my eyes. Maybe I need glasses. All of a sudden I look at computer screens too much with my job and my eyes were perfect. I mean, I was like 2020 or 2015. I mean, my eyes were amazing. And then the eye doctor, he was a younger guy. He goes, well, have you considered Lyme disease? And I was like, whoa, an eye doctor wow. bringing up Lyme disease as a possibility of my vision issues. This is crazy. And I said, well, you know, I have had several tick bites and, and all that. And so this was actually after I had done some initial Lyme testing, but I had never got a I had never got a clear answer. Most of those tests came up negative, which is another challenge is actually getting a, a positive diagnosis can be tough. And so that was cool. You know, that kind of opened my mind. I was like, wow, this eye doctor is smart. So I, I just, I thanked him. I was like, wow, I'm really proud of you. Thank you so much for bringing this up. I'm so glad to know my eyes are fine, but they're still not fine. So I'm going to go try to get better now. And that was the end of that consult. Wow, that is not something that you hear about very often. <laughs> like that they would be so sort of looking at things from a, a wider perspective like that, you know? It's like, okay, here's some glasses or something, but that's that's actually so amazing. Um, I hope he was on your podcast. <laughs> I, I never I never interviewed him, but he was a cool dude. I may, I may in the future. I feel like you just brought up a really good point too, and that's that a lot of the testing for these things can fall short. And can you kind of expand on that a little bit more of like what conventional testing looks like and, and like how people can figure these things out in terms of proper testing? Yeah. So with the gut, you know, a lot of these, like if someone presents with diarrhea, I'm not automatically going to think molar or Lyme. I may just think parasite, bacteria, candida. So like the advanced stool testing that we use or the urine organic acids testing are awesome because they find things that the conventional tests don't. The conventional tests with the gut in regard are just, they're outdated. They're using antigen-based testing. It's just not as sensitive as what we can use today with the DNA-based samples. So that's the, the, the long answer short is that it's just outdated and it's not as sensitive uh, regarding the Lyme and co-infection test. So the, the problem with these infections, a lot of people call them stealth infections, meaning that they like to really hide. And so like when we talk about Babesia, you know, we talk about Babesia being related to malaria and how it can get inside of the blood cells. So, you know, if you're trying to run some type of a serum panel, it's likely going to show a false negative, meaning that says it's negative, but you do have it. And so that's where you have to come into, we like to do some urine testing for these infections as well to try to see if we could just prove something on a piece of paper. 
There's also some antibody testing that we look at that's more sensitive than conventional. But problem is, you know, conventional medicine, CDC, which is the in the U.S. the Center for Disease Control, you know, they have a criteria that must be met for you to be considered positive for Lyme disease. So when you look at these, what are called bands, think of it like little rubber bands. You have your bands that line up with the kind of template bands, and if you have five or more of those bands, that could be considered a CDC positive, meaning like, yep, you got Lyme. Problem is, a lot of those bands don't show up positive, and some of those bands could show up for other things, meaning you may show positive, but that band could be for Epstein-Barr, that band could be for this, that band could be for that. So if you're trying to just use that type of testing, even then you're confused because you're like, well, do I have Lyme or not? Because this band could be Lyme, but it also could be chlamydia, right? So then you're like, well, what do you do? So once again, this is where the art comes in and you may have to actually go down the rabbit hole and assume based on symptomatology plus if you have some good labs, good, then you kind of pursue it. And if you get better or worse on the treatment, then you know you have it. If you do Lyme treatment and nothing happens, then you probably don't have it. So mm. unfortunately, I wish it sounded sexier than that, but that's kind of the reality <laughs> sometimes is that you really do have to guess and check, which I'm totally against. My whole philosophy, I tell everybody, test, don't guess. I'm a huge fan of testing. I, I use thousands of lab tests per year, but there are certain times where we scratch our head and we're like, you know what? We don't see it on paper here, but let's try it. Now, I had a woman who... Uh, and sometimes there's a budget issue where they just don't have the money to pay for the testing as well, right? Because this stuff's not covered by insurance because it's so far above the standard of care. Conventional insurance is not going to cover this stuff. This is considered like advanced or experimental or whatever. They've Whatever they can label it to make it not covered, it's not covered. But <laughs> Even though it works and it's awesome. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But no, yeah. no, no. So <laughs> no. I, ha I had a woman who both situations happened. She actually did have some testing done for Lyme and she showed up negative for everything. Uh, and she also had budget issues where she was unable to do more of the advanced testing that I wanted to do. And she kept complaining of this head pressure. She's like, I feel like my head is being squeezed. And I'm like, mm, sounds like it could be Babesia, but that could be Bartonella, could be Lyme. And so we kind of probed her on some of the other symptoms. And I'm like, well, what about you know, dizziness and what about EMF sensitivity or chemical sensitivity? And she goes, you know what? My hand hurts when I use my phone. Like when I'm on my phone scrolling on Instagram, which is a bad habit everyone needs to stop doing. Uh, she got hand pain, like her, her knuckles hurt. I'm like, hmm. Okay. So you're a little bit electro sensitive as well. You said perfume does bother you quite a bit. This sure sounds like mold, but it sure sounds like Bartonella as well. So what we did is we created a protocol to address Bartonella. And guess what? She emailed me after the first dose of everything. And she goes, my head pressure is 60% better on the first dose. I thought, whoa, 60% better on the first dose. Wow, we're onto something. So we kept pursuing it. And now the head pressure has gone. Now, if she gets off of it, what's going to happen? Is the head pressure going to come back? I don't know. We're not that far down the rabbit hole yet. But that's where you got to just, that was a guess and check example. That was a guess and check story because the the testing she previously had with conventional doctors showed negative. That's amazing. Uh, that's like a pretty fast response to like one dose uh, yeah, and the body's I, just like, boom. Yeah, I, I was, part of me was like, well, is that placebo? And then my answer goes, well, even if it is, I don't care because if it is <laughs> placebo, she got better. Yeah, exactly. If she, so. As long as she's feeling better, right? Back in May, I started hearing a lot of information about bioresonance testing, which is a form of testing that uses a small hair and saliva sample. You mail it away and it gives you a ton of information about your body. To say the least, I was a complete skeptic, but I decided to invest in a scan just to see what all the fuss was about. As a practitioner who watches her clients spend upwards of $400 on a food sensitivity test or $550 for a stool test or $500 for a hormone test, this bioresonance scan was a fraction of the cost of one of those things and it provided far more detail about what was happening in my body. I was so blown away by this experience. For example, one single test showed me the percentage of how well each of the systems within my body was performing. My digestive system, my endocrine system, 
system, my liver gallbladder, my heart, my immune system, and more. But it didn't only show me how well they were working, it also showed me what was the cause of any stress that might be happening on these systems, whether it be a virus, a parasite, a nutritional deficiency, or otherwise. So amazing. Next, it showed any energetic, environmental, and food sensitivities I scanned positive for out of a list of 350. Some of them were sensitivities I already knew I had, and others were a total surprise. For example, I learned that I'm sensitive to carrageenan, which is an additive commonly found in dairy and dairy alternatives, conventional cleaning supplies, and even things like trees and shrubs. Next, it showed me any nutritional imbalances I might be dealing with. Things like amino acids, enzymes, fatty acids, minerals, and vitamins. And then it showed me any energetic toxins I might be dealing with, things like bacteria, chemicals, metals, mold, parasites, and viruses. This test confirmed that one of the biggest things I was struggling with through my own health journey was the Epstein-Barr virus. I had always suspected it, but this test helped me to confirm it. And lastly, it looked at any energetic hormonal imbalances, things like cortisol, estrogen, progesterone, and even the thyroid hormones. And the final piece of the puzzle was an actual customized regimen I could follow to support my body in bringing things back into balance. Wow, this testing experience ended up being so transformative that I asked Samantha Stupak, the creator of Balanced Health, to be on the podcast. As a matter of fact, you can listen to that episode by heading over to michellebro.com forward slash podcast forward slash zero two zero for episode 20. Samantha was kind enough to hook listeners of the show up with $20 off as many scans as you'd like. To redeem this offer, just use the code GROWRADIO at checkout. And by the way, they also have a subscription service where you can register for a number of scans throughout your year, throughout your healing journey, so you can track your progress and continue to ensure your care is targeted to the exact areas you'd like to focus on. And the follow-up call that's included with your scan, absolutely priceless. So again, you can tune into that episode by heading over to michellebro.com forward slash podcast forward slash zero two zero and you can use code grow radio to save twenty dollars on as many scans as you'd like for you and your family well i feel like this is probably a question i should have asked closer to the start but it's kind of it's just kind of hitting me now can you just clarify what a co-infection is for people like i for example i didn't have borrelia come up on a scan but i did have babesia and rickettsia come up which are two co-infections so can you kind of give that clarification for for the folks listening sure good point yeah so my buddy scott he he told me when i told him about me dealing with Bartonella and Babesia, he goes, well, you got to have Lyme too. He goes, there is no co-infection without Lyme. And I'm kind of like, dude, I hope you're wrong. I really don't want you to be right. But after doing some Lyme specific herbs, I did seem to get a bit better. So is it true that everybody who has Babesia or Bartonella also has Lyme? I don't know. He thinks so. Uh, You know, he's done work with Klinghardt and Klinghardt's really focused on Lyme and a lot of these issues. So if he's right, then then a co-infection would mean something that comes along with Lyme, meaning you could have all these symptoms and issues from Lyme, which is caused by Borrelia burgdorferi, which is a bacteria named after a guy, Willie Burgdorfer, who did a lot of experimentation back in the 50s and 60s with ticks. They were actually part of a military program. I did a whole podcast with a lady named Chris Newby on this, and ticks were actually used as a weapon. Um, He and other people in this lab I believe it was in Colorado, were injecting various diseases into ticks through a like a force feeding operation. They'd put a tick in a thing and shove the disease into the tick, and then they were dropping bombs with thousands of ticks inside. They did this uh, in Cuba to try to incapacitate the sugarcane plantation workers. And Part of the weapon was designed to incapacitate these people, but not kill them because that would be wrong to kill somebody. So just make them as miserable as you can so they can't work and that would affect their economy, right? So are all these issues that people are dealing with, are these escaped scientific experiments? I think the answer is, yeah, totally. We have documentation that these things have escaped, but were there ticks out there that also did not have all these co-infections in them prior? You know, you hear about, 
Iceman. And then maybe this is some made up thing. Maybe this is true. I don't know. But supposedly there's a guy named Iceman, this 5,000 year old um, ancient human that was found in the ice and it, the ice melted and then they unearthed this man and then they tested the man and he had Lyme disease. Right. And that was before all these experiments happened. So, so was Borrelia truly in ticks 5,000, 50, 500,000 years ago. And now we're just victims of it or, or with the Bartonella and Babesia and all that are these new things. So when you get bit by a tick, when people say Lyme and co-infection, you could not just get Lyme, Borrelia, you could get Borrelia, Bartonella, Babesia, Riclia, uh, you've got the Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. I mean, you've got all these that could come from one bite. So according to a company, I interviewed a guy, I can't remember his name now, but there was a company called Tick Report, which is a place where you can mail in a tick and they'll tell you what is inside of it. According to their statistics, about 52% of ticks carry Borrelia, which is what causes Lyme. So that means if you get bit by two ticks, you probably got Lyme because you got a one in two chance of getting Borrelia. So, and then they also test all the co-infections, which become less common. But I don't know. I mean, they say less common, but I see quite a bit of the co-infections. So I don't know if that means they're becoming more common. I don't know if it's we're getting better at testing and finding them or what. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. That was actually my next question was going to be about um – Lime, Lime being used as biological warfare and like that whole, I, even though I feel like that could be a whole conversation in itself, like a rabbit hole of, of stuff. But I did listen to that podcast about it and it was just like, it's just mind blowing. The whole thing just blows my mind completely. Yeah, I, I did not. I tell you, that was one of the most uh, anxious book reads I've ever done. You know, I read her book, Chris Newby. She's a wonderful lady. Uh, the book is called Bitten. I don't get paid to say this, but it's a great book. And it's not, it wasn't even an opinion book. It's not like, hey, I think this is what happened. It's like, no, here's the papers. Here's the, un, here's the, the declassified government papers that said that we injected these ticks with these bugs and dropped them via bombs from planes onto people. Like, they're, like it's real. So reading through that book, I was like, Oh my God, because then it becomes a question of, okay, well, who's responsible then? You know, we've got, if you just look at, just look at the Center for Disease Control, just look at their statistics. They are saying 300,000 new cases of Lyme disease per year in the U.S. Mm. Okay, 300,000. Okay, so all these people that now have potentially lifelong chronic health issues like Justin Bieber, for example, Justin Bieber's, you know, he super famous, people don't know who he is, super famous young guy who's a musician who's toured the planet and ultra famous and ultra successful with his music. He canceled his music tour. I don't when several years ago, he just canceled his tour. And, you know, I've looked at pictures of him and he looked like he lost some muscle mass and his skin tone didn't look very good. And, and then it comes out, you know, relatively recently towards the end of 2019 that he was diagnosed with Lyme. Now he's probably got mold and other stuff too, right? But who knows? Maybe he'll get better just treating Lyme. Maybe he has other issues under underneath. But but that just goes to show you that amount of suffering is immense. Now who's responsible for that though? If this was a government weapon, okay, now you've got these 300,000 people that are going to get diagnosed this year. Well, who's going to pay the bill? Because all the testing we want to do, a lot of the natural herbs and treatments, those are not covered. So then these people are paying out of pocket, but it's not their fault. They're just a victim of the weapon. So it becomes this really, really tricky place to be. It's like you've got all these people like, you know, let's say there's a massive protest and people start, you know, marching to the White House. Hey, um, you all did these experiments in the 50s and 60s, and I want you to pay my medical bills. Who's going to who's going to pay the bill? Right. So. I don't know all the answers. I just know that it's a really interesting place to be. And based on her work, I mean, I told her, I was like, do you have like secret security? Do you have bodyguards? I said, do you know? I told her, I was like, do you know what you're doing revealing this? Like, I mean, this is potentially one of the biggest discoveries of the 21st century and, and you're blowing the lid on this. And here I am talking about it too. So I mean, I think <laughs> we're all putting crosshairs on our heads, but it's it's crazy to consider that 
the chronic health issues that we see were all because of this experiment that that went wrong because why did it go wrong? Well, think about all those ticks. They're going to replicate and replicate and replicate, and then they spread, 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 spread. So you, you may have dropped some infected ticks here, like Virginia was one of the sites where they dropped these ticks. Okay, Kentucky's not far from Virginia. We've got a lot of Lyme disease here. So did that spread or were these different ticks here? And those were their own ticks. And the, I mean, there's a lot of unanswered questions. Absolutely. And I feel like it's really, it's just this age of information that we live in where we can, you know, you're in the United States, I'm here on the East coast of Canada and we're recording a podcast, having a discussion about these things. Like people can spread information just as quickly as these things are coming to light. And, you know, there's just a whole other level of consciousness happening right now around these issues. The same thing with, you know, with the the whole EMF topic, which we definitely do not have time to dive into too far. But like, I'm, as this whole 5G thing is coming, you know, which I think a lot of my audience members probably are very familiar with. um, How is this going to impact all of these people with chronic illness and Lyme disease already and mold exposure already when they put a tower up right next to your home or your apartment complex or your, you know, your school or whatever? Like, how is this going to start changing our world rapidly, you know? Yeah, the answer is I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. There's a lot of speculation, a lot of fear mongering, which is not very beneficial because fear is only going to paralyze people unless it creates action then cool but most of the time fear is not beneficial but yeah i see a lot of schools around here that have cell phone towers on the property which is crazy or you've got farmers that'll you know typically how it works is the cell company will pay the person about five hundred dollars they'll typically sign them onto a 20-year contract so you know i've had several clients who they buy 50 acres in the country because they want to have plenty of land and and free space to roam. But then their neighbor right at the edge of the property boundary of the 50, like 50 acres sounds big, but it's really not when somebody could put a cell tower right at the edge of your property boundary because they get 500 bucks a month and they can get paid 20 years. So then all of a sudden their safe haven becomes a place where they're getting beamed with RF frequencies all the time. So I think all you can do is try to mitigate risk where you can. And I'm completely hardwired. I don't use Wi-Fi. I, like, this is an air tube headset. This is a rubber tube that goes to my ear as opposed to a wire. Uh, I try not to use my phone unless absolutely possible. I don't do any mindless activities on my phone or any wireless devices. Uh, everything in the house is hardwired where it can be hardwired. But ultimately the protest and such, they're not going to stop it. Now the telecommunications industry is more powerful than big pharma. So I think it's cool to see, Oh, petition this and petition that and sign this and sign that. It's not going to matter. And that's not the pessimist. That's the realist. Uh, Klinghart said the same thing when I interviewed him, he said that some of the things he said sound pessimistic, but they're not, they're realistic. And sometimes the reality sucks, but the reality is what it is. And so the rollout of this will not stop. It's, it's going to happen. It's, it's already happened. Dallas and Indianapolis and Las Vegas and Los Angeles, New York, San Francisco, Seattle, Washington. There's so many places that 5G has already rolled out. But being fearful won't do anything. So if you have the ability to create distance, you know, distance is your friend. So there's something called the inverse square law, which is just a very simple uh, – basically a a simple math, which means that the further you are and the, yeah, basically distance is, is the key, but also if you have barriers in between, meaning leaves, for example, but distance and, and obstacles are, yeah, are are (laughs) best. So there was a group in New Zealand who did some studies. They were testing some of these frequencies because that's really, you know, people hear about 5G and they don't really understand what it is. Basically what it is, is it's just a, it's a higher frequency than we're currently using. So like T-Mobile, they use a 600 millihertz, which is a very, very, very low frequency, but that has an ability to penetrate into walls. Like they actually market it like that. They're like, no more dead spots in your house. Our 600 millimeter, whatever, or millihertz will penetrate into your home. It's like, great. Just what I want you to do. Penetrate my home. So 
Whereas the 5G is more higher frequencies. You've got 30, 40, 50 gigahertz. These are much, much, much higher frequencies, but they, they have a much shorter wavelength. So they can't penetrate as deeply, which means this is actually a good thing because good thing for health purposes, because these New Zealand people, these researchers, they found that the 5G signal was reduced something crazy. I want to say it was 50 to 60% reduction just by the rain alone, because those short wavelengths could not penetrate through the rain. Also leaves on trees has been shown to block it. So that means you're going to have a seasonal variation of exposure, meaning if you've got some woods and on the other side of those woods, you've got a tower, unless you live in the jungle where the leaves don't drop, then this doesn't apply. But if you live where most people do, where you have deciduous trees that are going to shed leaves, then that means in the wintertime, you're going to have more penetration through those sticks when there's no leaves. And then when the spring summer comes, you'll have more leaves and more protection. So there's going to be kind of like a seasonal variability to how much you're getting exposed to as well. So I think distance obstacles are your friend and then just trying to preserve your sleep environment as much as you can. You know, hopefully the thought is if you protect your sleep, and you rest and recover and detox during sleep, hopefully that will think of it as charging your batteries or whatever analogy you want to use, putting on your defense shield, hopefully that will protect you enough so that your daytime exposures will not overwhelm your system. Totally. I always say like, you know, do, do what you can, but don't make yourself crazy over it. You know, don't let it make you just the awareness of it, make you more miserable than. <laughs> it's a fine um, line. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, so my final question would be for anyone who's listening to this, who is really resonating with this, perhaps someone who has Lyme disease, someone who has ha has some sort of mystery illness that they're still trying to figure out wherever they are, someone who's in their health journey in the thick of it right now. Is there anything that you can share any words of advice, guidance, support, and also on top of that, how can people connect with you who, you know, may be going through something like this and want to learn more from your practice? Sure. I would just say you got to, you got to stay motivated, which sounds easy. Um, but when you're in the thick of it, it's, it's quite difficult. And just know that there's probably an answer to what's going on. So if you've been struggling for a year, five years, 10 years, 20 years, and you've been to various practitioners and you haven't gotten better or you haven't or maybe you've gotten somewhat better but you haven't got fully out of the woods yet there's probably something that you just haven't found so think of that as exciting more than you think of it as daunting so you may think oh what else could there possibly be i don't want to deal with anything else i've already got this and this and this and this and that to deal with well no think of it as exciting think of it as exciting meaning hey i've actually found an answer of why i've suffered 20 years and now i'm actually going to be able to potentially reverse this issue or make this issue less impactful on my daily life. So that's the motivational piece. And then Amen. Uh, well said. <laughs> thank you. And then uh, regarding consults, yeah, I work with people around the world. So my site, Evan Brand, E-V-A-N Brand, that has everything. I've got the podcast, I've got hundreds of episodes up there. It's all free. 99% of what I do is free. And, and then there is the option of people that want to reach out clinically, you can do that at my site. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time today. It was so amazing to chat with you about all these topics. And like you said, we probably could have talked about it for another two hours because <laughs> it's, it's like something that has touched both of our lives so much. And I'm just so grateful for all the work that you're doing in the functional medicine space today. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.